promised a rainbow. The colors have drained away. Black queer blood remains. A white gay couple share their adoption story on my radio. How far have we come? What color is our freedom? It feels gray to me. Put it down, give it back. Women carry too much. How to escape the full weight of shame handed down. Violence done. Women, take this, carry that. Wear this wound, deep in blood and semen driven in. The blame, the hurt, receive that, carry it. The soft body taken, left broken, holding the burden. How many? For how long? The young boy pushes me down to the ground to see what hides between my childish thighs. The man pulls my five-year-old panties down, a tight smile, my disguise. My mother's instructions in niceness, not what it matters. My father's worry, his body awkward around daughters. My brother-in-law holding my young body too long, like a gag in my mouth, his unwanted tongue. My sister, his wife, insisting I had lied. The bry man rubbing to come against my young thigh. The pilot who kisses me out of sight of his wife. My boyfriend, his relative, says I've ruined their lives. A stranger, a male classmate, proclaiming to men friends I have a cunt a mile wide. Yet another male spreads his lies, claims I invite men's stares by rubbing my groin on a handrail. Another male friend warns me not to flirt, dance, dance with joy. The date rape, a doctor, when I've drunk too much wine. Me dragging shame home where it shakes me, still shaking. My soft young self impaled on societal crimes. My limbs tired, my mouth gagged by wretch, wretched self-blame. The married activist who grabs me, wanting me warm. Another comrade steadying his drunkenness, grabbing my breast. A doctor, seven years married, proposing my favors. The engineer married who opens his fly. My husband's affairs, rape, raping trust with his lies. The mysterious kind penis turned to wreckage disease. A friend's husband reaching to pinch at my bum says he'll await my invitation to comfort his groin. My dear friend, his wife, says she cannot believe this. So she's gone, gone, gone. I say no to them all, but they leave their poison. The blame, the hurt, the harm, the invasion. This is not the odd one. This is all too common. How many, for how long, Put it down, my brave sisters, put it down. Give it back directly where it came from. It's not your fault. It does not belong. Pick it up, men, pick it up. Call it out, name your shame. Take it back, take it on. A few years ago, I found out that my father was not my father that the disconnect in our relationship was more than just misunderstanding. It was biological. That what kept us apart was a distance so deep it ran all the way down to my DNA. I felt lost inside my own body and unaccustomed to my face. I felt guilty for my hair and cursed the shape of my eyes feeling as if my biology had betrayed me somehow. Later on, I learned that my father was of a different race and a religion completely. That I could probably relate to him even less than the father I already couldn't relate to. I've never met him face to face. Just a few awkward phone calls and excuses, which eventually died down after a month. I pondered on the fact that some of my roots had been ripped from the ground across the sea. Maybe that's why I don't always feel at home in my own body, because half of it belongs somewhere else. My mind bent inward, bombarding me with questions 
of whether it was too diluted to hear any of my ancestors speaking to me. Or maybe they were all just speaking too loudly and in so many languages that I just couldn't make them out. I felt destined to be confused and lonely, angry that I did not know all of the strong women that came before me, angry that I was denied a culture completely. There are entire worlds and people inside of me that I cannot connect to, that will take a lifetime to unpack and understand and grieve. This poem was, was written by a young woman called Poem, and I asked her to write to, to I asked her if I could recite the story as part of me collectively telling our narratives to disconnect, but it was also part of my commitment to lifting others as we grow and to be able to, she couldn't tell her story, and I said, I'll do that for you. Thanks, Kelly. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce myself. I'm Lebo, but you can call me Lebolicious. <laughs> because I like to be fabulous and doing delicious things in life. Okay, and Next to me are my beautiful friends and colleagues and partners in our commitment to make a difference and bring healing through writing, through um, the Writing Collective. Uh, the founder of the Writing Collective, um, Dawn. Dawn, you want to introduce yourself quickly? Right. I, I'm, I'm going to model a... Um, oh, whoops. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, an exercise which I'm going to ask you to do just now. Yes, okay. which is, I am Dawn, yeah. um, I hope I don't make you yawn, um, I'm not forlorn, because poetry makes me warm, so I know this is an academic meeting, but I'm going to ask you to get really silly just now, thank you Lebo. Thank you. Giles? My name's Giles, and my name rhymes with miles, smiles, and piles, <laughs> that's the one people mostly remember, thank you. Thank you. A little bit about uh, life writing and my journey with life writing. So life writing is an NGO, like I said. Uh, they basically what uh, we do, we run uh, courses around using writing as a healing modality to process our journey and what we go through in life. And this is really to find and discover your own personal meaning and the unfolding of your own life. So my journey with life writing started in 20. 2020, and when I, when I first found out about the program, it, it just stood out for me around how we write in our journeys from our ancestors. I never knew that sometimes, or not sometimes, but often our narratives come from our ancestors and what our ancestors have told us. And my journey through life writing has unfolded in the most extraordinary way that I never could imagine. So I just recently become, became a certified uh, level one diver, free diving in the ocean. And I never ever thought those could connect. But through my process with life writing, I started to experience stories of trauma, particularly trauma around water with my ancestors. I had one specific moment where I went with someone who's an advanced, live at the, uh, advanced diver at the ocean. Uh, cover of National Geographic, doing, doing extraordinary work around the water. And I don't know what it is. I think I had a, only something I could call time travel, because I was in the ocean to do free diving, and I went through a very traumatic experience. And there I was thinking that I was very comfortable with water. Turned out I wasn't. And I started to inquire that process. What is this all about? What is it that my ancestors had to go through with water? And I started to remember the water trauma, my ancestors being thrown overboard in the slavery ships. And what did that mean? It changed my trajectory around water, my relationship to it. And I started to attract opportunities. I mean, not in a million years did I ever think I'll get a fellowship as a filmmaker. Uh, doing underwater filming and being trained to really be comfortable around water, but it was around me trusting the process because I opened the channel. What does water mean for me? 
It was quite an extraordinary journey to go through and to discover all the narratives and the stories that I've carried. I started to remember my grandmother's stories. Don't go to the river. It's dangerous. You'll drown. When I started to remember those stories, I started to remember that she was remembering her own stories around water. So I took on this journey to be the one that was going to stop that narrative and rewrite the story. And me rewriting my story around water is my own personal journey. The question is, what's your story? What's your journey that you want to transform? What's the future stories you want your children to tell and their children to tell their children? And me, the rewriting narrative is also embedded within my academic work as um, someone in science communication and genomics research, writing stories about our genome and our DNA and how we've been carrying these narratives. So through life writing process, it has allowed me to go there, to go deeper, and to allow myself to feel the pain, to recognize the trauma, and to recognize how my way of being impact others, and to question how am I rewriting and moving forward around this. So I'm going to read to you this poem that I wrote when I completed my, um, my diving, free diving, uh, program. I wrote this poem as part of my own journey of healing and cleansing and building a purely extraordinary relationship with water. The ocean is in our blood. I once read something from a wise one that said, if I look deeper and closer enough, I will find edged memories of our connection to the ocean because half of me is water anyway. That apparently we have always been one with the ocean and that all the illusion of our fear of water is indeed just that, an illusion. That the true intent of the ocean with us was to remind us of our fluidity. That when looking deeper, the alchemist within will always be reminded of that connection that the waves of the ocean moves through our veins, that the, blood of our, that the taste of our blood is apparently not so different to that of the ocean, that the same ocean often reminds us to let go of that illusion, that the memories of our ancestors being killed in the vast ocean is not the whole story, that there's way more than meets the story about the ocean's true intent with us, that life started in water where we, where we all come from, that life is indeed an expression of the fluidity. The ocean is calling you. Come, child of the vast ocean of the earth. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. Thank you. Don, do you want to come next? It's actually me next. <coughs> um, this poem I'm going to read again is a more of a connecting poem. It's a poem again about our uh, ancestral stories. It's by one of our um, uh, most long standing members, and her name is Hani Dutoy, who sadly can't be with us, was going to be part of this today. And it's called simply The Day She Died. The day she died, she cooked a pot of food, pumpkin. The meat was browned in sugar, dark and sweet, the pumpkin soft and thick, mushy chunks of orange in brown gravy, shining with the fat she cooked it in, delicious stew. The day she died, my mother brought her pot and filled it to the brim with pumpkin stew. Her mum knew best how to make a hearty meal and steal a heart with food. The day she died, five beggars fed from that same pot of pumpkin stew on bread wrapped in waxed paper and the warmth of her tireless smile. The day she died, she washed out her pot, wiped clean with bread. She had begrudged herself 
the last beggar at the door, more hungry than she was. The pot washed, the kitchen cleansed and cleaned. She cleaned herself for prayer, then bent to pray, and was found that way the day my granny died. So this is a, also a connect poem. You might have noticed the disconnect poems in the beginning and how we're writing poems of connection. Because after all, that's what we're doing here. We're trying to connect with ourselves and with each other, with our environment, our, our earth, through the power of poetry, through the undervalued, but in this space, hugely valued, uh, correctly valued, uh, a capacity of the human spirit to create and create through music and rhythm in the most extraordinary ways. This is called Taking Notes. And there's a little um, extract from Marion Milner's book. It was here that the poet was the pioneer. Those times I'd rather die, not knowing how to live with grief or when the effort of life seems not worth it. I take a book of poems down from the shelf. These word islands Fertile, concise, create a breakwater stable enough for relief. I can sit a while in the shelter of a poet's encounter, taking courage in the knowledge that humans have been here before, broken and cold, barely alive. Their recordings show me how they've stayed open to all life's horror and loveliness listening and tending, faithfully mirroring, so as to set down these poem notes and survive. So we're here to write. This is actually a writing workshop, despite our performance to, to break the ice or break open the inquiry. And um, so what I'm going to, I just wanted to say um, that the way I think of it is you brush your teeth every day for dental health, and if you write every day, or any, any creative practice, it can be a, a collage or clay or drawing, or it can be any creative practice, doing it every day for your mental health. So it, creating that space to process, to debrief, to have a conversation with yourself with what you don't know you don't know about your own life. I mean, the problem is that we've already got the story up here. I know the story. It's pointless going there, I know the story. But we don't know the whole story. And if you write out of here instead of out of here, you, new information starts coming onto the page that you don't even remember afterwards that you wrote. You think, oh, I can't remember writing that. So you're having a conversation with the, the, it's like going over the border into the unknown. You know, there's messengers coming in. If you just open the door, let them in. The door you didn't even know was there. And writing is a way to, and we all know that, we're all doing it anyway. So anyway, I thought I'd just remind you. So the, the exercise, I'm going to lead you into visualization. I mean, the question is, how do we get out of our thinking, thinking mind that knows the whole story and is trying to stop us from going here because then we'll feel too much. So how do we, how, one way is through visualization, which is to get back into the sensory lived experience in your mind's eye, in your mind's body, and re-experience what happened so that you can report back as faithfully as possible, as Ursula Le Guin, Report back as faithfully as possible what you find there. So I'm going to lead you into visualization with your eyes closed. So you can put down your pens and paper and laptops and whatnot, please, and your cell phones, and please, you, are, you can put them to one side. And uh, if you close your eyes, it helps you to put yourself inside the experience again. And the invitation is to feel your way back to a time where you met someone or you read someone's work, it could be poetry, or you heard of somebody who gave you courage in the way that you felt unseen, unheard, unloved, marginalized, exiled, silenced, misunderstood, all those ways in which you felt that you didn't belong. But somebody came along and said, you do belong. I understand you. I get you. I'm like you, even. 
some mentor. It could have been a teacher. It could have been an aunt. It could have been a friend in the playground. It could have been someone at, at uh, school. Anyone in your life. Or you picked up a book in the library and the author spoke to you. And that feeling, as you are sitting there, or standing there, or running, whatever you were doing at the time, take yourself back to that actual environment. And you might have 20 people who supported you in being your true self. Pick one. Pick the one you're most curious about. The one that is saying, pick me, pick me. <laughs> and it might be hard to find somebody, but there'll be somebody in your life, even an imaginary friend who got you. So you're in that encounter with that imaginary or, or that real or red or imaginary or film. Maybe somebody on, in a film represented something you were or you wanted to be, gave you courage. So notice where you are. are you, what space are you in? What's the landscape? Are you outside? In the park? Are you in a place of worship? Are you in the office? Are you in the schoolroom? Are you in your bedroom? What, is the, what are the colors of the space? What's the, what kind of lighting? Is there natural light or artificial light? Is it a very quiet space or is there lots of sound? Is it quiet like in a library or is there a choir singing? Is there the sound of baking? or the television on, or the radio. Any smells in the space where you felt accepted and that you belonged, you felt seen and heard. And then there's this person in the space, or this person in this book, or in this movie, or it could even be an animal that gets you. So you're with this mentor, this encourager. And notice how you imagine that person if they're in a book or how they are in, in life, how they're sitting. What clothes are they wearing or that you imagine that they're wearing? That difference that you want to be in life, to be yourself. What are they doing in this space? Notice what their hands are doing. Do they wear spectacles? Do they wear jewelry? How do they wear their hair if they've got any? What's on their feet? Are they sitting quietly or are they doing something? Is there someone with them? Are they speaking or singing? And what's the tone of their voice? the textures of the space. There might be a sheet or the texture of sand underneath your feet. Is it hot? Is it cold? Pay deep sensory attention to what was going on in that space where you felt held and alive and hopeful. Hopeful there is a way forward. And when you've got the beginning of something yourself, this person, this land, this environment, and all the sensory information that fed into this experience. Take it to the page and start writing without stopping, without thinking, without punctuation, without worrying about all that stuff that destroyed our writing at school. Write one word, it's going to suggest the next, suggest the next. Just keep going. Try and keep your hand going, even if you don't know what, what's going to come next. Uh, just for 10 minutes, I'll be the timekeeper and try to hold it to that time frame because that's when these little moments come up that you didn't expect. Surprise yourself.
And this exercise can be a kind of honoring of somebody who shaped your life for the better. And they're still, you still carry them in your body in some way. But of course, our lives are shaped by all sorts of experiences, including people who put us down, who hurt us, who didn't understand us. And um, I'm reminded of several things. First of all, C.S. Lewis's idea that you can't go back to the beginning and change what happened, but you can start from where you are and change the ending. And that's, that's where creat creative practice is helpful in hel helping us change the story, because those, the people and circumstances that, we were, that influenced our lives, the stories we were born into, determine the story we tell ourselves about our own lives. How do we change that story into something more hopeful, more helpful, and, and this is one way of doing it, through regular creative practice. So the other thing I'm reminded of is that neuroscientists say that we make decisions and choices out of image and narrative. So this is why the story you tell yourself is so important, because it influences, even when you think you're making a conscious choice, you've know, worked out all the pros and cons, and now I know that this is the way to go, there's a little blip on the screen when they put electrodes on your head, there's a little blip on the screen before you make the choice. So there's something else going on that make, makes the choice for you. And the theory is that it's some image or narrative that's driving your life. So we better get to understand and interact with the images and narratives that drive our lives because they're shaping our lives. So the next part of the exercise, and the other thing that's important is how do we change anxiety and fear into curiosity? And by definition, the creative act is not knowing what's going to happen next. The trouble is we've already told ourselves the story. We know what's going to happen next, even if we meet the stranger. We know who they are, and then we know what's going to happen here, and they look like trouble. <laughs> you know, based on our cultural ideas, or our traditional ideas, or our you know, experience. So how do we stay curious? How do we stay open? Even about things that happened in the past, you know, because we don't have the whole story. This is not to underplay real trauma that has, has happened to us, but how do we make the frame a little bit bigger? So the next exercise is, again, I'm going to lead you into a visualization. Actually, that's not the right word. I, you've got to make up another word, because visualization implies you're only using your eyes. But it's a sensory exploration of a, a real lived sensory experience. So again, if you put down your pens and your paper and your cell phones and laptops, and close your eyes. Everyone can hear me at the back, I hope. They're all right there, okay. So, this might be a lot tougher to think of somebody who did not support you, who maybe even pushed you under a little. And I'm gonna suggest that you don't choose the worst thing that's ever happened to you, where someone really, really traumatized you but if you can choose something that was, was a lesser hurt, uh, maybe one that you've even recovered from, all well, these things tend to be connected, so it's hard to differentiate, but maybe try to approach this person. Here's this person in this situation where they've just put you down or um, yeah, just hurt you in some way and where are you? Is, does it take place in a room? And again, we've all had lots of experiences of being hurt or undermined, but maybe it's the classroom or the dining room. You know, it could be when you were young, it could be when you were older. Just choose one of them that wasn't too devastating to explore, because we're just exploring our own thought habits and behavioral habits around our experiences. So there's a scene. It could be um, at the park or in a car. Oh, lots of, lots of arguments happen in cars, <laughs> around the family dinner table, things like that. So, where are you? What time of day or night is it? What is the weather? Are there any smells in this space where something makes you very uncomfortable in your own skin? Something that makes you feel unworthy, unwanted, unloved, not seen, not heard, undermined, maybe. So who else is there? And what are they doing in this space? 
And what are they wearing? And what's the tone of their voice? And if we can hold on to a bit of curiosity, what happened there? Who is this person that they behaved like this? So what are the sounds in the space? Radio, TV, bird song, dogs barking, traffic sounds, the squeak of chalk on the blackboard. Really pay attention to the sensory details. It'll help you get back into that space. Where are you sitting or standing or walking? Are there trees? Are there, is there furniture around? Just have a good look around the space. Have a good listen, the textures of the space. And when you have something just to start on, uh, you know, pick up your pen and paper and let one word suggest the next. If anybody's getting really stuck, you can come talk to me outside, but you've got 10 minutes to explore that moment in your life, which has had repercussions, but try to do it with curiosity. What happened there? Still free writing, just one word suggesting the next for 10 minutes. image you're on. And now if you want to look over what you've written, the two pieces, and just underline anything that surprised you. It could be an image, it could be a, um, a phrase, it could be a word maybe that you haven't used for a long time. Anything that sticks out that makes you curious, that you want to know more about. I think of them as trap doors that go down to the next level of the poem, in a sense. So there's free writing where you just, it's the download. There's the download and then you check out what, what's arrived on the page and what's calling my attention. You can carry on with that just now if you haven't finished, but just to set up the next thing to do. Um, these are all suggestions. I just throw out suggestions, but you know what you need to do better than I do. But um, I loved what Kim Dark said this morning, that poetry is, the, is a space that can cope with complexity. You know, the trouble with, I think... I mean, I'm, I'm generalizing now, but the trouble with the, the um, interpretive analytical mind is that the logical, rational, it wants one answer. The poetic mind feeds off paradox and contradiction. 
So you can have very disparate images in the same poem or in the same painting, and they will spark off each other, and they will bring new meanings to the piece. So here you've got these two very different pieces, and there may be ways in which you can fit them together in interesting ways, and it just extracts. And just remember, they don't have to be full sentences in a poem. I mean, I'm speaking to a room full of poetry pac practitioners. I'm very nervous to say anything about poetry in this space, but um, I mean, I'm a doctor, you know, <laughs> but I am interested in healing. So um, the other thing I wanted to say about that is um, about, yeah, something about the trauma. Now, you see, I've lost it. Um, working with the, with the trauma and reimagining the story in a, in a complex way rather than a linear way. And there was something else I wanted to say, but now I can't remember. I'll, I'll tell you later. Um, so you just you know, spend about 10, I'll check in after 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and see if there's anything that comes out of those two pieces that you could weave together. I sometimes think of it as plaits. You know, the, there's several poems I know, they've got like three strands, and, and they're plaited together in the most interesting way. Because uh, there's always more than one thing going on at the time, at, at any point in time. So to write, and one thing is important is to write from the feeling. Ah, that's what I wanted to say. See, I knew it would come back. So um, this whole question of poetry: what is poetry? You know, poetry. We're living in the interdisciplinary zone in our culture. It seems to be more and more so. So prose is starting to look like poetry, and poetry is starting to look like prose, and theatre is starting to look like art, and art's starting to look like sound. You know, I mean, it's all these overlaps, which just gets very exciting for me. I need some, some sense of rhythm or rhyme, off rhyme, some music in the poem. And um, a, a mentor of Maya Angelou said to her, because um, she stopped speaking for four years after she was abused as a child, and this mentor said to her, I know you love reciting poetry, and poetry is music written for the human voice. So if you find a little bit of music in what you've written already, or add to it, Rhyming dictionaries, penguin rhyming dictionary is fabulous because if a word sticks out in your poem, like f once for me, the word coelacanth stuck out in the poem. I was just free writing about the unconscious and this word coelacanth came up as this image of the unconscious, this very ancient, subterranean, hardly known creature. And I'm thinking coelacanth, you know, the, uh, okay, the rhyming dictionary. What rhymes with coelacanth? And plinth came up, off rhyme, half rhyme. And it was perfect. There's a coelacanth. It's about, it was about me. There's a coelacanth, and then there's the pl plinth, you know? So it can, be, it can break the meaning of the poem open using a, m a rhyming dictionary. And you can use your phones if you want to I explore. So what's the time, Joel? Right. So I'll check in with you at quarter two and see how you're doing if you need a little bit more time. But just go and play and see what happens. Any, quest any questions, by the way, or comments? at this point. I don't see much writer's block in the room, which is rather fabulous.
those of you who've been writing haiku finished long ago, and those of you writing elegies have only got the, <laughs> the, the first stanza down here. <laughs> so obviously you're not going to finish the poem now necessarily, unless you're one of those people that just downloads complete poems onto the page. <laughs> it happens occasionally, not, not often. It can take three months to write a poem, as we know. So I'm going to suggest before Giles takes you through another writing prompt um, and then we're going to ask people if they want to read a little piece of their poem or even if it's just one line because you know this is raw writing and you may not want to share but if you want to stand up and just read one thing that surprised you from your poem or the whole poem you're very welcome but just to break the ice amongst each other um, could you turn to somebody behind you or next to you that you preferably don't know and introduce yourself with your name as a silly rhyme. I mean, it can be deep and profound if you really want it to be, but <laughs> we can allow ourselves to be very silly. Okay, have you done it both ways? We've both done a silly rhyme. We're sort of allowed to have too much fun, apparently. Thank you. When, you, when you've learned each other's names by rhyme. Can I bring you back into the room? <laughs> Clearly not. Thank you. Okay, we're, we're going to do one last, slightly more formal poetry exercise, he said falling over the chair. And this one, I'm asking you to write one or more, depending, it's going to be quite a short time, it's a short poem, an intersectional haiku. Now, the haiku, the, there are several haikus, but the, the most common one is the five-syllable, seven-syllable, seven-syllable, five-syllable. So it goes five, seven, five. Doesn't have to rhyme. You can see we're really high tech. You, doesn't have to rhyme. Um, generally, the idea is that the last line sums up the haiku. It doesn't have to, I don't think. I'm, I'm quite kind of blase about these things. I'm sure I shouldn't be. Probably the academics would shoot me down. So what I'm suggesting you do is write something about yourself again that's intersectional. I'm going to give you a couple of examples so that you got a sense of it. Here are a few. Grumpy, gray, white man. That's what I look like, but I'm gay on the inside. Not South African. Tried to be European. Boris fucked that up. <laughs> GWM in ads. Not a Chinese motor car but a gay white male. And then finally, books and covers, though, always things you cannot see beneath the surface. So that's just a couple of ideas. Simple, five, seven, five. Do as many as you want. We're going to give you just five minutes for that, because it doesn't take too long. It's now 47 past, so let's say we'll give you until five, two, a little bit, a little bit longer. So. Eight minutes till five two. Okay, clear? Go for it. Speed haiku indeed.
just a couple more minutes, so maybe finish off the one that you're on or polish the one that you are keenest on, and then we'll move into the, the next stage, which Lebo will lead for us. So just, just one more minute. So, I think this is a part where we're trying to source, uh, to source your ability to inspire others, maybe share uh, what came up um, in your poetry or what you wrote. You don't, as Don said, you don't have to share everything, but it's an opportunity for others to, you know, to share what we learned and to encourage others and to inspire others and to also build those um, connections, really get connected to our human connectedness. Is there anyone who'd like to share their poem? One line, two lines, or if not the poem, um, what's there for you? Thank you. So I have a short poem. I don't know what it means, but short middle aged Newadi Nepali, short description of me which defines me, entered the poetic inquiry world with enthusiasm, energy, and intrigue to connect science and arts as, I as is, entered the poetic inquiry world. S T E A M, just words which means integrating different subjects which literally means water vapor. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Well done. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, as Dawn always says, don't apologize before you read. <laughs> Feet on floor. Okay. Um, it's fun like that, off the bat. I'd say that benign as it is, my misery stem from laughing at all. Blue water off a duck's back. Shrug like it's hot, drop it like it's hot. The 90s neglect. Mm. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. There's one more person. Thank you. I have tried one haiku. <laughs> Cape Town. The mother's land, safe, hospitality, warm welcome, voices of hearts, symbolism of the poetic inquiry. Thank you. Brilliant. Yes. Here's one more. Okay, I'll share the first one, that the first activity. Um, memory space, suspended, illuminated mother figure, black and white dog loving, trusting gaze, full feminine form, open to my gaze, three loving images, mother, lover, animal. The gaze shifts, a school fence on the mountainside, barefoot children learning of loss, him dying of COVID, my dream dreaming his, his dream dreaming me, the unconscious link. There's one more person there at the back. Mm-hmm. How life moves like waters to the sea, destination the ocean, deep and vast as our thoughts. Who are we really? Who am I? Wow. Mm -hmm. Powerful. As I put pen to paper, I remember the days of old when writing was done on walls and caves and marks on the sand. We wrote our parts on journey, of journey and a people seeking place, space amidst the vast domain and terrain, 
leaving parts well trodden in the sand. The sand of time, like the hourglass, measured by our calculating minds, accustomed by the pace in which we are conditioned to measure time. The thoughts flood in from different spaces, clutter and confuse, but amidst the settled knowing that this process is true to being. I let go of all that holds me back to flow with the rhythm of time, to align myself to the times gone by that tell the stories of my past. Past that transcends time and space, no limitations, no bounds, free to be faulted and free to learn, open as a book of stories I have yet to write. Writing as I am, currently finding my path in a river that unfolds and draws me in to a world that knows my path. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Anyone else? else? Um, I dance my joy, I dance my pain, movements in and out of my convoluted brain. <laughs> awesome. In front here, Joe. I just want to add that, isn't this a wonderful way to meet people, you know? <laughs> we should do this more often. My father named me after tasty chocolate, inspired by sweetness. Your bones, skeletal bones, the grief in your bones, flint stones fire my flames, stirring warmth in mine, marrow bones, inside, inside full and fluid. Anyone else? Okay. I can share mine quickly. Yes. Can I? Okay. That's the second one. My grandmother's neatly dressed kitchen and bedroom in one is my sacred space. So what do you mean, why am I standing here naked? Don't you see this shack is my clothing? What are you doing beneath my clothes? This space is my sanctuary. This space is my safety. And yet, you have the audacity to walk in here and violate me. Where did you get that false power masqueraded this courage? When did this narrative become such an art of life for you? Oh, lost soul of fear and shame. Do you mind me knowing how you navigate your story? When are you freeing yourself of your narratives? To be fair, we are not here to mess with our own calling, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who's, who's um, shared their stories. I don't know, um, do you think in... Uh, with, uh, with the organization, can people submit their uh, poems and put them into a no, I Is there any, are there, are there any questions, first of all? Yeah. Then we'll talk a little bit about the life writing and we're gonna end on a poem. Yeah. Any so questions, yeah, about life writing? Okay, I just wanted to say a little bit about the organization. You can see the banner here. Um, the LRC teaches life writing and raises funds for sponsored memoir courses and publications. That includes poetry courses, obviously. Um, and it's been in existence about five years. We've had five years this year, in fact. It, it's been our fifth birthday this year. And the premise is, as, as Dawn has, I think, explained through the exercise that she led, is that writing about your life in whatever format, whether it be poetry, whether it be prose, whether it be prose poetry, or indeed scripts or film scripts, any, any type of writing can be a healing process and that's why our strapline is the healing power of writing. We run courses throughout the country. Um, they've been online predominantly recently, but they were historically face-to-face, uh, -face, that is 
the better way, quite honestly. People connect better, as to some extent we have today. Um, so there are a variety of platforms, there are a variety of themes. There's an audio course which you can buy and do in your own time, which has, I think, 17 modules to it, uh, very reasonably priced. Um, all available on our website, which you can see on the screen in front of you. That's the home page. It's Life Writing, R-I-G-H-T, as in setting your life right, dot com. Um, and you can see at the top there, you just click on courses and you'll see a huge range of courses from three-hour online courses to three-day in-person courses, not just on memoir and, and, on, and on poetry, but on themed things like We've got one called Edible Memoirs, which is around food and how important that is for our memories. Um, we've got one on loss, specifically called Lost Found. We have one, as Lebo mentioned, called Ancestral Stories, which is a particularly popular one. As a, a Yes, thank you, yes. Um, My Life as a Work of Fiction is another course that we do. Sometimes we need to kind of slightly disguise our story for various reasons. Uh, we're also doing a course which is a, a mix of family constellation therapy and the ancestral stories uh, course in the Eastern Cape later in the year, the first week in November. Uh, it's a very interesting place called the Crew Rest. So I'm not sure where all of you are from. That may or may not be relevant. Um, but our online courses obviously are accessible from anywhere in the world. So have a look on our website. Um, and if you're interested in, in joining, them, joining any of our courses, just please do click in the right place and we'd be, we'd be great to have you along. Any questions about what we do and who we are at all? All good? If I, if I can just add that yeah. we raise funds to sponsor people in the space, so any, we don't turn anyone away for lack of funds. So people who can afford the courses help to sponsor people who can't afford the courses. Uh, we've got an, our next poetry one, it's on our website, it's coming up at, 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 it, at Ikropo Buddhist Retreat Centre mm -hmm. in November. No, June. Oh, no, no, June. June. There's one in June and one in November. Uh, Linda Kaoma is doing the one in June, yep. uh, but we're going to be organizing another one in Cape Town or online soon. And they're often hybrid, so you can join from wherever. So we have sometimes have a mix of both. We've just done a memoir, which is both, and I think we're going to do another one in October, which also will be a combination with Linda again. Okay, shall we go into the last section? So we're going to wrap up with what we feel is a really powerful connecting poem, um, certainly intersectional in part as well. And we're going to read it in three parts, and I'm going to lead with the first section. It's called Say Yes, and it's by Andrea Gibson. When two violins are placed in a room, if a chord on one violin is struck, the other violin will sound the note. If this is your definition of hope, this is for you. The ones who know how powerful we are, who know we can sound the music in the people around us simply by playing our own strings for the ones who sing life into broken wings, open their chests and offer their breath as wind on a still day when nothing seems to be moving. Spare those intent on proving God is dead, for when your fingers are red from clutching your heart, so it will beat faster. For the time you mastered the art of giving yourself for the sake of someone else, for the ones who have felt what it is to crush the lies and lift truth so high the steeples bow to the sky, this is for you. This is also for the people who wake early to watch flowers bloom, who notice the moon at noon on a day when the world has slapped them in the face with its lack of light. For the mothers who feed their children first, and thirst for nothing when they're full. This is for women and for the men who taught me only women bleed with the moon. But there are men who cry when women bleed, men who bleed from women's wounds, and this is for that moon on the nights she seems hung by a noose, for the people who cut her loose, and for the people still waiting for the rope to burn, about to learn they have scissors in their hands. This is for the man who showed me the hardest thing about having nothing is having nothing to give. Who said the only reason to live is to give ourselves away. So this is for the day we'll quit our, quit our jobs and work for something real. 
We'll feel for sunshine in the shadows, look for sun, sh sun rays in the shade. This is for the people who rattle the cage that slave wage built, and for the ones who didn't know the filth until tonight. But right now are beginning songs that sound something like people turning their porch lights on and calling the homeless back home. This is for all the shit we own, and for the day we'll learn how much we have when we learn to give that shit away. This is for doubt becoming faith, for falling from grace and climbing back up, for trading our silver platters for something that matters, like the gold that shines from our hands when we hold each other. This is for the grandmother who walked a thousand miles on broken glass to find that single patch of grass to plant a family tree where now the fruit grows to laugh for the ones who know the math of war has always been a subtraction. So they live like an action of addiction. For you, when you give like every star is wishing on you, and for the people still wishing on stars, this is for you too. This is for the times you went through hell so someone else wouldn't have to. For the time you taught a 14-year-old girl she was powerful. This is for the time you taught a 14-year-old boy he was beautiful. For the radical anarchist asking a Republican to dance, cause that what's the chance of everyone moving from right to left? If er, the only moves they see are NBC and CBS. This is the no becoming a yes, for scars becoming breath, for saying I love you to people who will never say it to us, for scraping away the rust and remembering how to shine, for the dime you gave away and you didn't have a penny, for the many beautiful things we do, for every song we've ever sung, for refusing to believe in miracles because miracles are the impossible becoming true and everything is possible. This is for the possibility that guides us and for the possibility still is waiting to sing and spread the wings inside us. Cause tonight, Saturn is on his knees, proposing with all of his 10,000 rings that whatever song we've been singing, we sing even more. The world needs us right now more than it ever has before. Pull all your string, play every chord. If you were writing letters to the prisoners, start tearing down the bars. If you are handing out flashlights in the dark, start handing out stars. Never go a second hushing the percussion of your heart. Play loud. Play like you know the clouds have left too many people cold and broken. And you are their last chance for sun. Play like there's no time for hopping brighter days will come. Play like the apocalypse is only four, two, three. But you have a drum in your chest that could save us. You have a song like a bread that could raise us. Like the sun rising to a dark sky that cries to be blue. Play like you know we won't survive if you don't, but we will if you do. Play like Saturn is on his knees, proposing with all of his 10,000 rings that we give every single breath. This is for saying yes. This is for saying yes. Thank you. And that brings our program to a completion. You want to say something, Don? Thank you for your courageous and curious participation. Lovely to be in the same space as you and to be part of this incredible uh, ISP program. And thanks very much for the organ to the organizers. Thank you. Uh, the books are, will be available in the book room um, or, short, here. or here, shortly hereafter. <laughs>